one. Beth learned of her mother's death from a woman with a clipboard. The next day, her picture appeared in the Herald Leader. The photograph, taken on the porch of the gray house on Maplewood Drive, showed Beth in a simple cotton frock. Even then, she was clearly plain. A legend under the picture read, Orphaned by yesterday's pile-up on New Circle Road, Elizabeth Harmon surveys a troubled future. Elizabeth, eight, was left without family by the crash, which killed two and injured others. At home, alone at the time, Elizabeth learned of the accident shortly before the photo was taken. She will be well looked after, authorities say. In the Methuen home in Mount Sterling, Kentucky, Beth was given a tranquilizer twice a day. So were all the other children, to even their dispositions. Beth's disposition was all right, as far as anyone could see. But she was glad to get the little pill. It loosened something deep in her stomach and helped her doze away the tense hours in the orphanage. Mr. Ferguson gave them the pills in a little paper cup. Along with the green one that evened the disposition, there were orange and brown ones for building a strong body. The children had to line up to get them. The tallest girl was the black one, Jolene. She was twelve. On her second day, Beth stood behind her in vitamin line, and Jolene turned to look down at her, scowling. You a real orphan or a bastard? Beth did not know what to say. She was frightened. They were at the back of the line, and she was supposed to stand there until they got up to the window where Mr. Ferguson stood. Beth had heard her mother call her father a bastard, but she didn't know what it meant. What's your name, girl? Jolene asked. Beth? Your mother dead? What about your daddy? Beth stared at her. The words mother and dead were unbearable. She wanted to run, but there was no place to run to. Your folks, Jolene said, in a voice that was not unsympathetic. They dead? Beth could find nothing to say or do. She stood in line, terrified, waiting for the pills. You're all greedy cocksuckers! It was Ralph in the boys' ward who shouted that. She heard it because she was in the library, and it had a window facing boys. She had no mental image for cocksucker, and the word was strange. But she knew from the sound of it they would wash his mouth out with soap. They'd done it to her for damn, and Mother had said damn all the time. The barber made her sit absolutely still in the chair. If you move, you might just lose an ear. There was nothing jovial in his voice. Beth sat as quietly as she could, but it was impossible to keep completely still. It took him a very long time to cut her hair into the bangs they all wore. She tried to occupy herself by thinking of that word. Cocksucker. All she could picture was a bird, like a woodpecker. But she felt that was wrong. The janitor was fatter on one side than on the other. His name was Scheibel, Mr. Scheibel. One day, she was sent to the basement to clean the blackboard erasers by clomping them together, and she found him sitting on a metal stool near the furnace, scowling over a green and white checkerboard in front of him. But where the checkers should be, there were little plastic things in funny shapes. Some were larger than others, there were more of the small ones than any of the others. The janitor looked up at her. She left in silence. On Friday, everybody ate fish, Catholic or not. It came in squares, breaded with a dark brown dry crust and covered with a thick orange sauce, like bottled French dressing. The sauce was sweet and terrible, but the fish beneath it was worse. The taste of it nearly gagged her. But you had to eat every bite, or Mrs. Deerdorf would be told about you, and you wouldn't get adopted. 
Some children got adopted right off. A six-year-old named Alice had come in a month after Beth and was taken in three weeks by some nice-looking people with an accent. They walked through the ward on the day they came for Alice. Beth had wanted to throw her arms around them because they looked happy to her. But she turned away when they glanced at her. Other children had been there a long time and knew they would never leave. They called themselves lifers. Beth wondered if she was a lifer. Jim was bad, and volleyball was the worst. Beth could never hit the ball right. She would slap at it fiercely or push at it with stiff fingers. Once, she hurt her fingers so much that it swelled up afterward. Most of the girls laughed and shouted when they played, but Beth never did. Jolene was the best player by far. It wasn't just that she was older and taller. She always knew exactly what to do, and when the ball came high over the net, she could station herself under it without having to shout at the others to keep out of her way, and then leap up and spike it down with a long, smooth movement of her arm. The team that had Jolene always won. The week after Beth hurt her finger, Jolene stopped her when Jim ended, and the others were rushing back to the showers. Let me show you something, Jolene said. She held her hands up with the long fingers open and slightly flexed. You do it like this. She bent her elbows and pushed her hands up smoothly, cupping an imaginary ball. Try it. Beth tried it, awkwardly at first. Jolene showed her again, laughing. Beth tried a few more times and did it better. Then Jolene got the ball and had Beth catch it with her fingertips. After a few times, it got to be easy. You work on that now, here? Jolene said and ran off to the shower. Beth worked on it over the next week, and after that she did not mind volleyball at all. She did not become good at it, but it wasn't something she was afraid of anymore. Every Tuesday, Miss Graham sent Beth down after arithmetic to do the erasers. It was considered a privilege, and Beth was the best student in the class, even though she was the youngest. She did not like the basement. It smelled musty, and she was afraid of Mr. Scheibel. But she wanted to know more about the game he played on that board by himself. One day she went over and stood near him, waiting for him to move a piece. The one he was touching was the one with a horse's head on a little pedestal. After a second, he looked up at her with a frown of irritation. What do you want, child? he said. Normally she fled from any human encounter, especially with grown-ups, but this time she did not back away. What's that game called? she asked. He stared at her. You should be upstairs with the others. She looked at him levelly. Something about this man and the steadiness with which he played his mysterious game helped her to hold tightly to what she wanted. I don't want to be with the others, she said. I want to know what game you're playing. He looked at her more closely. Then he shrugged. It's called chess. A bare light bulb hung from a black cord between Mr. Scheibel and the furnace. Beth was careful not to let the shadow of her head fall on the board. It was Sunday morning. They were having chapel upstairs in the library, and she had held her hand up for permission to go to the bathroom and then come down here. She had been standing, watching the janitor play chess for ten minutes. Neither of them had spoken, but he seemed to accept her presence. He would stare at the pieces for minutes at a time, motionless, looking at them as though he hated them, and then reach out over his belly, pick one up by its top with his fingertips, hold it for a moment as though holding a dead mouse by the tail, and set it on another square. He did not look up at Beth. Beth stood with the black shadow of her head on the concrete floor at her feet and watched the board, not taking her eyes from it, 
watching every move. She had learned to save her tranquilizers until night. That helped her sleep. She would put the oblong pill in her mouth when Mr. Ferguson handed it to her, get it under her tongue, then take a sip of the canned orange juice that came with the pill, swallow, and then when Mr. Ferguson had gone on to the next child, take the pill from her mouth and slip it into the pocket of her midi blouse. The pill had a hard coating and did not soften in the time it sat under her tongue. For the first two months, she had slept very little. She tried to, lying still with her eyes tightly shut, but she would hear the girls in the other beds cough or turn or mutter, or a night orderly would walk down the corridor, and the shadow would cross her bed and she would see it, even with her eyes closed. A distant phone would ring, or a toilet would flush. But worst of all was when she heard voices talking at the desk at the end of the corridor. No matter how softly the orderly spoke to the night attendant, no matter how pleasantly, Beth immediately found herself tense and fully awake. Her stomach contracted. She tasted vinegar in her mouth. And sleep would be out of the question for that night. Now she would snuggle up in bed, allowing herself to feel the tension in her stomach with a thrill, knowing it would soon leave her. She waited there, in the dark, alone, monitoring herself, waiting for the turmoil in her to peak. Then she swallowed the two pills and lay back, until the ease began to spread through her body like the waves of a warm sea. Will you teach me? Mr. Scheibel said nothing, did not even register the question with a movement of his head. Distant voices from above were singing, bringing in the sheaves. She waited for several minutes. Her voice almost broke with the effort of her words, but she pushed them out anyway. I want to learn to play chess. Mr. Scheibel reached out a fat hand to one of the larger black pieces, picked it up deftly by its head, and set it down on a square at the other side of the board. He brought the hand back, and folded his arms across his chest. He still did not look at Beth. I don't play strangers. The flat voice had the effect of a slap in the face. Beth turned and left, walking upstairs with the bad taste in her mouth. I'm not a stranger, she said to him two days later. I live here. Behind her head, a small moth circled the bare bulb, and its pale shadow crossed the board at regular intervals. You can teach me. I already know some of it, from watching. Girls don't play chess. Mr. Scheibel's voice was flat. She steeled herself and took a step closer, pointing at, but not touching, one of the cylindrical pieces that she had already labeled a cannon in her imagination. This one moves up and down, or back and forth, all the way, if there's space to move in. Mr. Scheibel was silent for a while. Then he pointed at the one with what looked like a slashed lemon on top. And this one? Her heart leapt. On the diagonals. You could save up pills by taking only one at night and keeping the other. Beth put the extras in her toothbrush holder, where nobody would ever look. She just had to make sure to dry the toothbrush as much as she could with a paper towel after she used it. Or else not use it at all and rub her teeth clean with a finger. That night, for the first time, she took three pills, one after the other. Little prickles went across the hairs on the back of her neck. She had discovered something important. She let the glow spread all over her, lying on her cot in her faded blue pajamas, in the worst place in the girls' ward, near the door to the corridor and across from the bathroom. Something in her life was solved. She knew about the chess pieces and how they moved and captured. And she knew how to make herself feel good in the stomach and in the tense joints of her arms and legs with the pills the orphanage gave her.
Okay, child, Mr. Scheibel said. We can play chess now. I play white. She had the erasers. It was after arithmetic, and geography was in ten minutes. I don't have much time, she said. She had learned all the moves last Sunday, during the hour that Chapel allowed her to be in the basement. No one ever missed her at Chapel, as long as she checked in, because of the group of girls that came from children's across town. But geography was different. She was terrified of Mr. Shell, even though she was at the top of the class. The janitor's voice was flat. Now or never, he said. I have geography. Now or never. She thought only a second before deciding. She had seen an old milk crate behind the furnace. She dragged it to the other end of the board, seated herself, and said, Move. He beat her with what she was to learn later was called the scholar's mate. After four moves, it was quick but not quick enough to keep her from being fifteen minutes late for geography. She said she'd been in the bathroom. Mr. Shell stood at the desk with his hands on his hips. He surveyed the class. Have any of you young ladies seen this young lady in the ladies? There were subdued giggles. No hands were raised, not even Jolene's, although Beth had lied for her twice. And how many of you ladies were in the ladies before class? There were more giggles and three hands. And did any of you see Beth there, washing her pretty little hands, perhaps? There was no response. Mr. Shell turned back to the board, where he had been listing the exports of Argentina, and added the word silver. For a moment, Beth thought it was done with. But then he spoke, with his back to the class. Five demerits, he said. With ten demerits, you were whipped on the behind with the leather strap. Beth had felt that strap only in her imagination, but her imagination expanded for a moment with a vision of pain like fire on the soft parts of herself. She put a hand to her heart, feeling in the bottom of the breast pocket of her blouse for that morning's pill. The fear reduced itself perceptibly. She visualized her toothbrush holder, the long rectangular plastic container. It had four more pills in it now, there in the drawer of the little metal stand by her cot. That night, she lay on her back in bed. She had not yet taken the pill in her hand. She listened to the night noises and noticed how they seemed to get louder as her eyes grew accustomed to the darkness. Down the hallway, Mr. Byrne began talking to Mrs. Holland at the desk. Beth's body grew taut at the sound. She blinked and looked at the dark ceiling overhead and forced herself to see the chessboard with its green and white squares. Then she put the pieces on their home squares, rook, knight, bishop, queen, king, and the row of pawns in front of them. Then she moved White's king pawn up to the fourth row. She pushed Black's up. She could do this. It was simple. She went on, beginning to replay the game she had lost. She brought Mr. Scheibel's knight up to the third row. It stood there clearly in her mind on the green and white board on the ceiling of the ward. The noises had already faded into a white, harmonious background. Beth lay happily in bed, playing chess. The next Sunday, she blocked the scholar's mate with her king's knight. She had gone over the game in her mind a hundred times, until the anger and humiliation were purged from it, leaving the pieces and the board clear in her nighttime vision. When she came to play Mr. Scheibel on Sunday, it was all worked out, and she moved the knight as if in a dream. She loved the feel of the piece, the miniature horse's head in her hand. When she sat down the night on the square, the janitor scowled at it. He took his queen by the head and checked Beth's king with it. But Beth was ready for that, too. 
she had seen it in bed the night before. It took him fourteen moves to trap her queen. She tried to play on, queenless, to ignore the mortal loss. But he reached out and stopped her hand from touching the pawn she was about to move. You resign now, he said. His voice was rough. Resign? That's right, child. When you lose the queen that way, you resign. She stared at him, not comprehending. He let go of her hand, picked up her black king, and set it on its side on the board. It rolled back and forth for a moment, and then lay still. No, she said. Yes, you have resigned the game. She wanted to hit him with something. You didn't tell me that in the rules. It's not a rule. It's sportsmanship. She knew now what he meant, but she did not like it. I want to finish, she said. She picked up the king and set it back on its square. No. You've got to finish, she said. He raised his eyebrows and got up. She had never seen him stand in the basement, only out in the halls when he was sweeping or in the classrooms when he washed the blackboards. He had to stoop a bit now to keep his head from hitting the rafters on the low ceiling. No, he said. You lost. It wasn't fair. She had no interest in sportsmanship. She wanted to play and to win. She wanted to win more than she had ever wanted anything. She said a word she had not said since her mother died. Please? Game's over, he said. She stared at him in fury. You greedy! He let his arms drop straight at his sides and said slowly, No more chess. Get out. If only she were bigger. But she wasn't. She got up from the board and walked to the stairs, while the janitor watched her in silence. On Tuesday, when she went down the hall to the basement door carrying the erasers, she found that the door was locked. She pushed against it twice with her hip, but it wouldn't budge. She knocked, softly at first and then loudly, but there was no sound from the other side. It was horrible. She knew he was in there, sitting at the board, that he was just being angry at her from the last time, but there was nothing she could do about it. When she brought back the erasers, Miss Graham didn't even notice they hadn't been cleaned, or that Beth was back sooner than usual. On Thursday, she was certain it would be the same. But it wasn't. The door was open, and when she went down the stairs... Mr. Scheibel acted as though nothing had happened. The pieces were set up. She cleaned the erasers hurriedly and seated herself at the board. Mr. Scheibel had moved his king's pawn by the time she got there. She played her king's pawn, moving it two squares forward. She would not make any mistakes this time. He responded to her move quickly, and she immediately replied. They said nothing to each other but kept moving. Beth could feel the tension, and she liked it. On the twentieth move, Mr. Scheibel advanced a knight when he shouldn't have, and Beth was able to get a pawn to the sixth rank. He brought the knight back. It was a wasted move, and she felt a thrill when she saw him do it. She traded her bishop for the knight. Then, on the next move, she pushed the pawn again. It would become a queen on the next move. He looked at it sitting there, and then reached out angrily and toppled his king. Neither of them said anything. It was her first win. All of the tension was gone, and what Beth felt inside herself was as wonderful as anything she had ever felt in her life. She found she could miss lunch on Sundays, and no one paid any attention. That gave her three hours with Mr. Scheibel, until he left for home at 2.30. They did not talk, 
either of them. He always played the white pieces, moving first, and she the black. She had thought about questioning this, but decided not to. One Sunday, after a game he had barely managed to win, he said to her, You should learn the Sicilian defense. What's that? she asked irritably. She was still smarting from the loss. She had beaten him two games last week. When white moves pawn to queen four, black does this. He reached down and moved the white pawn two squares up the board, his almost invariable first move. Then he picked up the pawn in front of the black queen's bishop and set it down two squares up toward the middle. It was the first time he had ever shown her anything like this. Then what? She said. He picked up the king's knight and set it below and to the right of the pawn. Knight to KB3. What's KB3? King's bishop three, where I just put the knight. The squares have names? He nodded impassively. She sensed that he was unwilling to give up even this much information. If you play well, they have names. She leaned forward. Show me. He looked down at her. No, not now. This infuriated her. She understood well enough that a person likes to keep his secrets. She kept hers. Nevertheless, she wanted to lean across the board and slap his face and make him tell her. She sucked in her breath. Is that the Sicilian defense? He seemed relieved that she had dropped the subject of the names of the squares. There's more, he said. He went on with it, showing her the basic moves and some variations. But he did not use the names of the squares. He showed her the Levenfish variation and the Nydorf variation, and told her to go over them. She did, without a single mistake. But... When they played a real game afterward, he pushed his queen's pawn forward, and she could see immediately that what he had just taught her was useless in this situation. She glared at him across the board, feeling that if she had a knife, she could have stabbed him with it. Then she looked back to the board and moved her own queen's pawn forward, determined to beat him. He moved the pawn next to his queen's pawn, the one in front of the bishop. He often did this. Is that one of those things? Like the Sicilian defense? She asked. Openings. He did not look at her. He was watching the board. Is it? He shrugged. The queen's gambit. She felt better. She had learned something more from him. She decided not to take the offered pawn, to leave the tension on the board. She liked it like that. She liked the power of the pieces, exerted along files and diagonals. In the middle of the game, when pieces were everywhere, the forces crisscrossing the board thrilled her. She brought out her king's knight, feeling its power spread. In twenty moves, she had won both his rooks and he resigned. She rolled over in bed, put a pillow over her head to block out the light from under the corridor door, and began to think how you could use a bishop and a rook together to make a sudden check on the king. If you moved the bishop, the king would be in check, and the bishop would be free to do whatever it wanted to on the next move, even take the queen. She lay there for quite a while, thinking excitedly of this powerful attack. Then she took the pillow off and rolled over on her back and made the chessboard on the ceiling and played over all her games with Mr. Scheibel, one at a time. She saw two places where she might have created the rook-bishop situation she had just invented. In one of them, she could have forced it by a double threat, and in the other, she could probably have sneaked it in. She replayed those two games in her mind with the new moves, and won them both. 
She smiled happily to herself and fell asleep.